My girlfriend and I moved to a new apartment about six months ago. From the first night we moved in, I noticed weird things out of the corner of my eye. I see what looks like dark, static figures in our hallway and bathroom. Sometimes the figures move, but they mostly look like they're just standing still. I never see them fully, only out of the corner of my eye. When I turn to look, they vanish. We have a cat and dog who have both acted strangely when it comes to the bathroom. My dog demands to be with me, and if I do not let him, he freaks out, which is something he's never done. Also, our cat will sit in the dark bathroom for hours, also something that is a new behavior. There have also been many times where my dog will start growling or barking at the hall or bathroom. Whatever it is, it usually doesn't do anything physical, except for one time. I had a migraine, so I was sitting in a hot shower with the lights off. Suddenly the cabinet door under the sink opened and slammed shut. When I looked at it, expecting to find the cat or dog, there was nothing. I was alone. That was several months ago, and it's the only time something physical has ever happened. I told my girlfriend about it, and she agreed the apartment has a weird vibe, but she hasn't seen the figures. I'm just curious if anyone else has experienced this. I feel like the stress is just maybe making me crazy or something. Maybe not. This happened to me not long ago, and it confirms to me that our house is haunted. We have had some questionable experiences living here, but this, to me, is a no-brainer. I was walking through the hallway and down the stairs to get to the kitchen, empty thermos in hand, acquiring some water for my girlfriend and myself. When I got to the kitchen, I heard someone coming down the stairs behind me. Knowing people were home, I thought nothing of it. I continued toward the sink, but I turned around just to see who it was. When I got to the sink and had turned all the way around, prominent footsteps faced me and stopped at the bottom of the stairs. There was nobody there. I stood there for a second, wondering if something would appear or walk back up the stairs or something, but nothing. So I filled up the bottle and went back upstairs, and as it turns out, nobody had been up. Let me just start this off by saying that in our culture, apple trees are said to be cursed. They're said to be homes for children who died young, women who were killed or died while pregnant, and things like that. It is said that if you pick an apple or a leaf off the tree, you're going to have bad luck or even die. My half-sister lives in an old village in Bosnia, and many deaths happened there so it would be no surprise that elders said the trees were cursed and that the kids shouldn't eat the apples that were on them. Apparently in the 30s, a pregnant woman died of blood loss while giving birth underneath that tree, the one that's in front of my half-sister's house. It was common for women to give birth under trees in that village, and it's not a myth because her grave can actually be found in the graveyard and some of her family members are still alive to confirm it. Anyway, my niece and I, as the foolish kids we were, shook the tree one day until a bunch of apples fell down. We put them in a bucket and ate a couple, and threw the rest into a lake near my half-sister's house, just for fun. Around one month later, I came back to the village for my half-brother's wedding, and saw that the tree was gone. I asked my sister about this, but all she said was, there never was a tree there. Everybody knew about this tree. Everybody talked about this tree. But now everybody's acting like it never was there. I am legit so creeped out. I 
I've always been a believer in both religion and the paranormal. I would see shadows standing outside my door when I was at my dad's house, and I would see and hear the occasional door slam. I never really thought my mom's house was haunted though. Sometimes things would be out of place, but that's about as far as it would go. This one instance in particular, however, has changed my whole perspective on my mother's home. It was about one in the morning and I was playing PS4 with some friends from back home. My grandmother was sitting in her lazy boy and my brother was getting in the shower. We'd just gotten through a game when all of a sudden I heard an eight note jingle of We Wish You a Merry Christmas. It sounded straight up like some kind of festive ringtone. I ignored it at first as I assumed that it was coming from my brother's phone. But he always brings his phone with him into the bathroom when he showers, so I didn't know what to think. The source of the sound was coming from the back room just opposite of mine. It was a decrepit old room filled with toys from my childhood, as well as some leftover decorations. I tried to ignore it, but it persisted, growing louder. I finally got up and walked toward the room, hesitantly. I could hear it coming from just to my left side as I was about to enter the room. And then it stopped, without warning. It didn't finish the tune like it was a toy off the rails. It was as if it sensed my presence and just decided to cease. I was both creeped out and dumbfounded. I looked around in that room for at least 30 minutes, but I have seen all of our Christmas decorations and we don't have anything that plays a jingle like that. I know this sounds silly, but I couldn't sleep that night. The air felt a lot heavier, and I just couldn't sleep. I felt something was watching me from that back room. I've tried to find anything that resembles that jingle on YouTube, but to no avail. I mean, surely I've heard we wish you a Merry Christmas, but not the same sound and tone like this thing. I've honestly never heard anything like it. It freaks the hell out of me. So I finally talked my friend into moving from Seattle to Texas. We decided to split it into two parts. The first one last week, moving her stuff in a rented SUV. Since we both had some time, we decided to take the trip on all the back roads. We stayed at a Mineral Springs resort in the middle of nowhere of Oregon, and that was amazing. On the second day, we got up to drive to Vegas. We took US 50, which is known as the loneliest highway in America. So I'll admit before this, it was eight to 10 hours before we had any human contact. I'm a former over-the-road trucker and a U.S. veteran, so I'm used to traveling to different places and being in new surroundings every day. But it also taught me to listen to my instincts. Let me tell you, did they come in loud and clear while on this trip a few hours away from Vegas? We stopped to get gas, and as we rolled into the place, it just looked very aged and dated. My friend decided to get gas and I walked inside to look the place over and get some snacks. I can honestly say that I can't point to any one thing that was wrong, but the feeling that overcame me was indescribable. It basically told me that this place was out of place and if I wanted to leave or be able to, I needed to go right now. Now I'll admit that it could just be my own experience and maybe because I had such a bad feeling, I was imagining things. But the minute I decided to leave without buying anything or even using the restroom, I swear everybody in this place started looking at me. I don't just mean the employees, but the patrons too. I walked quickly to the car and told my friend that if she believed in instincts, we should get in the car and leave right now. We did and we didn't breathe easy until we were 10 miles away from that place. I've heard a lot of people have weird experiences and spooky encounters in the middle of Death Valley, and I guess now I do too.
This happened when living in Indian Springs across from the base. We lived in a one-story, older home. One night, my significant other heard a noise outside, got a flashlight, and shone it out an open window. He called his oldest son over to the window too. They saw what my partner, who was a scientist by the way, working on the installation there at the time, described as a dark, human-like creature, about two and a half to three feet tall. He quickly retreated from the window to wake me up. At this time, the creature jumped up onto the roof. So as he was shaking me awake, all I saw was my partner's white face and then heard two thumps on the roof. Then I heard something hit the ground behind us, outside the window that was facing the backyard. My partner grabbed the flashlight again, and he and his son went to the back door to look out. The creature was now lurking by some bushes in the backyard. After a few minutes of watching it, it skittered away outside of flashlight range. They were both white as ghosts and trembling as they described this thing. My significant other's son was friends with the son of the police chief. He told his friend what they'd seen, and the friend related it to his father. His father, the police chief, came over shortly afterward, off the record of course, and told us that he had gotten calls from tourists and people passing through, who had also described encounters with this creature. He was highly intrigued himself, and wanted more information on it. He said that he had seen fuzzy pictures of it, and that these sightings were years apart, and that the people who called in to report it didn't know one another. We are miles away from the springs now, but every time I've mentioned that night to my significant other, he still goes white as a sheet. My great-great-grandpa swore that the devil appeared to him in a Mexican desert when he was a young man. Some time ago, my grandpa was telling me the story that he had once heard from his own grandfather when he was a boy. My great-great-grandpa lived in Mexico and worked in agriculture. One day, he was out in the fields, sitting down under a tree, kind of grumbling and feeling sorry for himself. He wished that he was a rich man, so that he would never have to work so hard again in his life. While he sat there daydreaming about how much better his life could be if he had money, this man literally just appeared out of nowhere. He was dressed in cowboy garb with leather chaps and everything, and dangling from his entire body were gold coins that jingled with every slight movement. The strange man also had money pouring from his palms, he held it out to my great-great-grandpa and said, Timoteo, do you want to be rich? My great-great-grandpa, realizing that this had to be some sort of trick, tried to figure out what to do next. He knew there had to be a catch. No one would walk around wearing money, handing it out for free. He panicked and went to fetch his horse. But when he turned back around just a few seconds later, the cowboy dude had vanished. It was like he blinked and the guy was gone. My great-great-grandpa rode home like crazy and locked himself in the house the rest of the day, convinced that Satan himself had just shown up and tried to tempt him into sin and damnation. Apparently, he was very insistent that he hadn't just dreamt it or imagined the whole thing. My grandpa still tells this story without the slightest hint of humor. It's like he totally believed what his grandpa had told him so many years ago. I guess I'll never know for sure, but I always wonder. I was an assistant librarian in a Hawaiian middle school as usual, I was asked to print copies and fix a machine as one of my many tasks. Every machine I walked next to, in more than one room, made a loud electronic hum when I was near, or a beep, which was odd but not unsettling. It only made me slightly curious. 
The broken machine worked just fine, and people would look at me strangely when I said that. The music in the library was always on the AM station. That's right, only classical music was allowed in there. I was cleaning the glass door, and the music went from classical to static for a bit, and then to full-on hip-hop. The librarian screamed at me, saying, Why did you change the radio station? I was fed up with her always yelling at me, so I finally spoke up for myself and yelled back, You're closer to the radio. You're right next to it. I'm cleaning the glass door. There's no way I could have changed it. We stared at each other with anger like an old western showdown for a long minute or two. Then the hip-hop music went to static and back to classical. We stopped staring at each other then and carried on with our daily duties. The radio didn't malfunction after that. The day continued and school teachers entered the library asking me how my day was going. Cheerfully and kind of joking, standing with my hands on my hips like a superhero, I said, I'm an electric girl because all the machines were coming to life with noise when I walked by them. That there was a broken machine that only worked for me and that weird things happened with the radio station. So today, I must have electrical powers, so I am electric girl. A little later, the librarian screamed for me saying that I had a phone call. My sister called me to tell me that her dad had died that day at 12 p.m. We were half-sisters, and she just wanted to let me know. When I got off the phone, the librarian yelled at me not to have people call me at work. Mind you, this was the first time that it ever happened. I told her what my sister said and told her maybe that's why the radio station was being weird. She said she didn't care what the reason was, nobody should ever call me there, and that there must have been rain somewhere to mess up the station. It was a sunny and peaceful day all over the island that day. I worked there for three years, and the radio station never did that before. When I arrived at my apartment complex, the elevator acted weird for me too. I stretched my hand out to the button, and it made a weird noise right before I touched it. Then, when I was in the elevator going up, it fell a floor or so and bounced back. I said out loud, Okay, this is enough. Now you're scaring me. You need to stop. The elevator then started to move properly back up to my floor, the fourth floor. Nothing weird happened after that. I think I might have scared my sister's dad's ghost away. I told my half-sister and her siblings what happened that day, and they said it sounded like something that their dad would do because he was a prankster. I know my half-sister sounded mad. She asked me, why would her dad visit me? I said, I don't know. I thought it was weird too. Why would my sister's dad's ghost visit me? I wasn't even blood-related. I wasn't raised by him or with him or near him. I knew I visited him on holidays and just the last week before he died, with lots of people knowing that he might die soon, hence the visit. He was losing his mind a bit toward the end. My half-sister told me that her father told her I had visited, but he told her this days after I had actually visited because he'd only just then figured out who I was. It's also strange that this spirit visited me quickly after his death if not exactly at the time that he died and stuck around for hours after. So after writing my personal experience down, I thought, hey, maybe I should see if this ghost reached out to his family. So I messaged his family members individually on Facebook to see if they had had any paranormal experiences too. Her dad had a shit ton of kids by different ladies. I guess he was one of the first to ask in ancient times for friends with benefits. I guess they were still living their hippy-dippy days with free love, even though babies with diapers does not sound free to me. My mom would say, he must be doing something right. Yuck. Then she went on to tell me that she couldn't share a man, so she left. However, she still dragged me to all these shin digs that they would go to. I guess I was a human shield for my mom to feel brave, who knows. Let's just say the holiday gatherings felt a little weird, with all these women and kids there and the only man there was my half-sister's dad. I sensed some jealousy with these fake-ass smiles coming from thirsty women. Thirsty for one dude, regardless of the obstacles. They always talked shit about each other to me. Then they told me not to say anything like they thought my mom was a prostitute. So there's no confusion. Whenever I use the word his, I am probably referring to the dead guy, so just keep that in mind. 
We'll start with his grumpy daughter, my half-sister, who worked two jobs, 16 hours a day. Not sure if she was just sleep-deprived when she experienced this, but she would never admit it. She said the night before her dad died, she saw his face in her bedroom curtain. He was alive in Pukulani when this happened, and she was on the other side of the island in Napoli, in her house. Now I introduce to you his widow, a long-term groupie. I only say that because I saw her at all the holiday gatherings and never understood the connection until 20 plus years later when she finally married him. He never had kids with her, so I thought, maybe just friends? All my sister's dad's groupies passed away from old age, except for one. He snagged the last one alive and put a ring on it when he had one foot in the grave. It's like marrying your caretaker but with benefits. Anyway. She said the night he passed, she had a clear dream of him being with others, happy and joyful. Three days after he died, she could feel the weight of someone sitting on her bed. When she thought of him, a song on the radio about magic came on. He was a magician. And she found a painted rock with an angel on it and thought that it must have been from him. His youngest kids both said that occasionally they had very vivid, almost lucid dreams where their dad was talking to them, giving them advice telling them how much he loves them and so on. The youngest daughter is a badass skater chick. I only say that with mad respect because she won a lot of competitions. She said whenever she was trying to make very hard decisions about her life, her dad always tried to protect her by pointing her in the right direction, in her very vivid, almost lucid dreams. Her dad's ghost once told her in a dream to take the offer. He was referring to a plane ticket that her sister had offered her to get away from an abusive ex. Later, the ex told her he was going to get counseling and that he had changed. At the time, she was very torn and wanted to go back to him, believing that he was sorry and that he would go to counseling. Her dad warned her again in a dream and she didn't listen. She left the safety of the women's shelter to see him and got kidnapped. He strangled and beat her almost to death in front of their baby. He put bruises on the baby too. The ex is sitting in prison now, and she said basically nothing good has ever come from ignoring her dad dreams. And now I finally bring you to his youngest son, little bro, who I will always remember as the naked kid running around the house while everyone screamed for him to put clothes on and he giggled. He's grown up now. I shared my experience with him. He said his dad used to have a radio show when he was young and always seemed to be interested in the way that electronics worked. So he became an electrician. So, it's kind of ironic what happened to me. He went on to share his story, that an old light in his garage where his dad used to hang out turned on and off a lot after he died. He said that he really wanted to dream about his dad, and years later he finally did. In his first dream, his dad was sitting in a chair next to his wife in a room. He asked his dad, What are you doing here? His dad's response? I've always been here. Three or four months later, he had a very vivid dream in full color with him in a magic prop studio. He used to be a magician too. He was able to have a full on hour long conversation where he could ask his dad questions and he gave back answers. He asked his dad, does everyone want to be happy? The dad said, no. His dad would always say inspirational stuff to him like, do what you want to do, not what other people say you have to do but mostly they talked about magic. Before you know it, his son was getting constantly booked for magic shows. He said that his dreams really helped give him the confidence he needed to become the magician he is today. He said that he feels he channels his dad's spirit at all of his shows. He's still getting advice from his dad and his dreams to this very day. After he messaged me all this info, he went to go pick up his friend, and his car smelled like his dad. Weed, cigarettes, beer, and incense. He said that he got kind of teary-eyed after that. And now to his sweet vegan daughter. She said she didn't have anything paranormal happen to her. That sucks, I guess, but it happens sometimes. I have had a lot of ghost experiences in my life, but I was super bummed when I didn't have one when I really wanted to, when one of my best friends hanged himself over a heartbreak. I begged his spirit to show me a sign, but I never got one. I don't understand why sometimes paranormal things happen and sometimes they don't. I don't always understand why spirits choose to show themselves to some people and not others. Maybe there was a sign, but it never looked paranormal to me, 
so I didn't notice it. Growing up, I had a ton of weird experiences, but I think this is one of the hardest to explain. It happened when I was about three years old. For context, my mom fell pregnant with me a month after her aunt died in a fatal car crash. When I was born, I would often react to things that nobody else could see, usually with laughter or cute baby noises. Eventually, as I grew older, I had an imaginary friend. When I was asked what she looked like or what her personality was like, apparently I described my mom's aunt exactly. Anyway, back to the story. I'm a small child and can't talk properly yet. I'm walking to see my grandma with my mom, which was about 10 to 15 minutes away. We're walking down a small, quiet residential road that has a junction at the end and probably about 30 yards away from the junction. As we start to approach the end of the road, my body language changed and I started to panic. I grabbed onto my mom with both hands and started screaming, no mommy, no. My mom looked ahead and saw nothing, just a quiet residential street. She tried to calm me down, but with all my might, I held on to her and tried to physically prevent her from walking any farther. I just kept shouting, no mommy, no. She started to get frustrated as this went on for about two minutes. All of a sudden, there was a huge crash. My mom looked up and at the end of the road, a car had completely lost control, gone over the side of the road and crashed into a front garden wall, exactly where we would have been walking if I hadn't made a fuss. Still to this day, we can't explain it. It was so out of character for me to have done something like that and I could honestly only speak a few words. It surely would have killed me and probably my mom too. I literally owe my life to whatever it was that saved us that day. Since then, I occasionally have premonition dreams that turn out to be true. Or I can wake with a sense that a friend I haven't seen for a while is upset. It isn't as often as I'd like it to be, and I'm still never 100% sure if it's coincidence or if I'm onto something. Any advice would be appreciated. The Fairbanks, Alaska area has an older cemetery, Clay Street, that I was drawn to for a while when I was 18. A boyfriend of the time had family buried there, and we visited to keep the graves clean. Me being the edgelord I was, I took a picture on one of the gravestones. It was the grave of a little girl, and it stuck with me, so I made peace with her by leaving a cute little picture. I often have dreams of this ex-boyfriend and that I'm pregnant with a little girl, not pregnant by him now, just a dream. There are a lot of areas in Fairbanks that give me a nope vibe. The gold dredge out by the Chatney Lodge, that always gives me a bad vibe and is said to be haunted. I spent a lot of my childhood in Valdez and we would always go hang out at the old Pioneer or Chinese cemetery out by Robe River. Old Town Valdez, the OG Valdez that had to be destroyed because of the 64 earthquake, has a weird vibe too. Valdez often has reports of UFO sightings. I believe I've seen one too. There are satellites that monitor the pipeline, but you can detect the pattern and know what they look like. Unless the pattern and lights changed for a few minutes for some reason on the satellite and then it was definitely a UFO. There have been reports of alien abductions in the Nome area. One day I innocently wore my alien shirt out there and I had to change. Apparently they get a lot of alien hunt tourism and it's not welcomed. In this area, there's really nowhere for people to go unless they fly out. People chalk up random disappearances here as people just getting drunk and falling into the ocean or getting eaten by wildlife. Considering the culture there, that is likely the explanation. But still. One of the dorms at UAF, 
had a student there who was murdered with no witnesses, and the case has been cold for nearly 30 years. They never remodeled the bathroom she was found in. One day I had this weird urge to sit in the tub there, so a friend of mine went and did that. It felt surreal to just sit in an empty tub in this bathroom. We were both overcome with this overwhelming sadness, likely due to us sitting there in this tragic bathtub. All I know is the Fairbanks area is really weird, and so are a lot of areas out there. Who knows what any of it means. So this story happened about 20 years ago, you know, before cell phones and fast internet. When I was little, my family used to make a really big deal about Christmas. They made it a goal every year to go and see as many of our relatives as possible. I have six uncles, two aunts, and a crap load of cousins, and that's just on one side of the family. Because of how many people we had and the fact that everyone's Christmas plans with their other family members were all at different times, we used to celebrate Christmas with this side of the family at around 10 p.m. on Christmas Day. We would all hang out until well after midnight and this was all at my grandma's house. My grandma's house is way out in the country. My grandpa was the pastor of a Baptist church that was conveniently located about 100 yards in front of their house. Religion was always a big deal, and we would always have church service first, and then presents. So this one Christmas, we were nearing the end of church service, and one of our elderly cousins, who was always there and spent the whole day and night with my grandparents every year, hadn't shown up. Let's call her Betty. Everyone was getting really worried about her. I was 10 at the time, but I could still see the worry in their faces, even though they tried to ease us kids. There was no answer at her house, and like I said, cell phones weren't really a thing back then. Also, to get to this tiny little town, you had to take this long, dark, curvy road way out into the woods, and we knew her eyesight was getting bad. Betty finally shows up, and as she pulls in, we all sigh in relief. But when she gets out of the car, she's white as a ghost. Everyone was trying to figure out what was wrong, but I think she was in shock because she wouldn't talk to anyone. Finally, after some time of resting, she told us that on the way there, it had been raining and a man was hitchhiking along this dark stretch of road. After nearly hitting him, she decided to have the Christmas spirit and pick him up against her better judgment because it just wasn't safe for him to be there. She made him sit in the back because she wasn't completely comfortable with the situation. And as she was driving along, she started talking to him you know, just pleasantries, and the man wouldn't talk back. Finally, trying to figure out what was wrong, she looked into the back seat at the man, and his face was changing colors, and his appearance was scary, as she put it. When he finally spoke to her, he said in a very loud voice, Gabriel's horn is to his mouth, and then he completely vanished from the back seat. Now, when it comes to the paranormal, I'm usually a skeptic, but this one makes my stomach turn because of the type of person Betty was. She was a God-fearing woman who was elderly and definitely not the type of person to lie in any fashion. She also wasn't really the joking or prankster type. So it being well thought out and some kind of elaborate prank is out of the question. To this day, it still gives me chills. This all started a few months ago. My friend and I found out about skinwalkers, and for a while I just knew that I had one following me. But after a while, everything stopped. But now things have progressively gotten worse. It all started as one night I was talking about creepy things on the phone with a friend of mine. Some things started happening. Lights would flicker, my phone wouldn't charge, the fan would turn on and off, things like that. 
but there was never an electrical problem in the house. Then the nightmare started. Every night for weeks, I would have a nightmare about a skinwalker or moving to a new house and it being haunted with demons or losing somebody that I love. The dreams don't sound that bad, but trust me, they were terrifying. One of the skinwalker ones was so bad that I didn't sleep for days because quite frankly, I was too afraid to. I've never had nightmares like this before. And then the sleep paralysis started. It's always a girl or a monster that stands in the corner and gets closer every time I blink until it's right on top of me, choking me, and then I snap out of it. It's terrifying, and now every time I'm by myself in the darkness, I have this heavy feeling of being watched. It's so bad that it gives me immediate anxiety. I hear things calling my name out of my window and it smells like rotting meat. Things scratch the side of the house. It's awful. I can never fall asleep because I'm afraid of what's in store for me when I do. And it's always the same demon in the dreams. Sometimes when I wake up, I see it and it fades into the darkness. Once in my nightmare, it whispered into my ear and said, I will follow you throughout your life. If you look into the darkest corner of your room, you will always see me staring back at you. Someone please help me with what this is. No one will listen, and I think I'm losing my mind. My paranormal experiences started really early on. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12, and I was just seven. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but here are some of the shorter ones. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person crawling on all fours with dislocated joints, coming down the hallway and wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name thinking that it was me trying to scare her. When she saw that I poked my head out of the day room, which was added on to our trailer, her face lost color. She realized it couldn't have been me. She had me go into my room and dig out a Halloween mask that was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said the figure was wearing it and she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit. When she looked at him closer, she could see that his skin was pale and that it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. One time when I was doing this, my dog started to whimper. Before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male voice breathe heavily in my ear. My dog proceeded to freak out and bark. These are the shorter stories that I have, but my entire life has basically been haunted. Moral of the story, don't mess around with Ouija boards. So this happened roughly six years ago in Pennsylvania, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was working for Burger King at the time, and I had just gotten off the night shift at roughly midnight. I was driving home, and I saw a light that was about 50 feet off the ground. It had an orangish glow like a street light. I could see it very clearly. The night sky was clear, and there was no fog at all. I thought it was just a new street light that had gotten put up. I just kept staring at it. Out of nowhere, this thing shot straight up in the air and just vanished. It gave me chills and made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Ever since that day, I've always looked to the sky on my drives home from the job that I have now. I don't know if it was extraterrestrial or what, but 
It was something. At the end of August 2016, I had open heart surgery, and while I was under, I had no heartbeat function for nine hours. I had an experience that felt like I went to the other side. I don't know what to call it, but this is what I saw. As a note, there was no fear. I was not afraid at all. I became aware that I was somewhere. I was holding on to, with my right hand, what felt like a piece of cloth. I felt like I was standing on a rock in space, like the dirt or soil or sand under my feet was gray and appeared like what you would see on the moon. To my left was utter pitch black darkness. Directly in front of me, I was holding on to with my right hand what felt like a piece of cloth, like I said, and this cloth was on a much larger thing or being in front of that which obscured my vision. I had to see or look around this being. It looked as though there was a cave or something. It was very dark in that cave and very gray where I was. Out of the cave of the darkness came what I can only describe as a worm-like figure as big as I was. It had a purple face and no facial features, just gaseous purple stuff. And it came right towards me, hard and fast. As it got close, it was repelled from me and made a squealing noise and scampered back into the darkness. Another one came out of the darkness and came toward me also. It reflected from what seemed to be some sort of force field around me. It also made a displeased sound and then ran back into the darkness, leaving behind the purple gaseous trailers, like tracers. I don't even know how else to describe them. I realize that the thing I'm holding on to is sort of like a Grim Reaper, for lack of a better description, but it wasn't a Grim Reaper. It was different. But it was clothed in the black cloth-like material that I was holding on to with my right hand. Then another really, really big worm came out of the darkness, and this thing just charged at me like a horse at full speed. I braced for impact. I wasn't afraid, I just braced for the impact I thought was coming. It screamed out as though it felt pain when it got close to touching me. It never actually touched me, it just got really, really close. It too left behind a purple trail as it scampered back into the dark cave that was ahead of this, I guess what we'll call a gatekeeper instead of the Grim Reaper. I looked to my left and there's nothing, just a void of darkness. But up and over to my right, I see a cluster of stars or lights. There were pink and blue with yellow, and it looked so inviting. I felt like that's where I wanted to go. I felt my feet lift up off of the thing I was standing on, and it's as though my feet just came up off the ground. My body tilted, and I began to turn toward that light or cluster of lights. I'm still holding onto the cloth, and I can't seem to let go. And as I pretty much decided that I didn't want to come back here anymore, I was happy being where I was, or wherever I was getting ready to go. The gatekeeper thing I was holding on to looked down at me and very condescendingly said, Not today. Not your day. At that point, I woke up in the ICU and I was intubated. You're not supposed to wake up intubated, I was told. I was on a fentanyl and morphine drip, so I would not wake up but once I was awake, I couldn't fall back asleep. I stayed like that, conscious, for 25 hours until they finally decided to use propofol to put me back into a coma-like thing. They left me there for 30 hours. When I woke up, I was ready to start pulling tubes out. I recovered really quickly and life is great, and it's been nothing but a journey since then. I guess it was a near-death experience, or something weird. I don't really know what it was, but it was interesting, and I thought I'd share. I had a dream one night about my sister's ex-husband's sister. 
In real life, she was sweet yet troubled. She was bipolar, grew up with an abusive father, partied a lot, moved many times, and changed her name a few different times. Sometimes her first name, sometimes a variation of her first name, sometimes a nickname, or sometimes even her middle name. I never got to know her very well. She was kind, and she and her brother were very close. I hadn't thought about her in a solid year or more. I didn't have a deep connection to her or anything. And one night, she's in my dream. The dream didn't really have anything to do with me. It was her and her baby. She didn't have a baby in real life that I knew of. And they were so joyful and happy and peaceful together. At one point, her mom was there, being happy and peaceful with them. I can't even explain the premise of the dream, but that's how dreams go, I guess. It was just about her and her baby and them being so happy together. I woke up and thought it was weird, but I didn't think that much of it, as I often have pretty colorful dreams. I check my phone and I have a text from my sister saying that this woman I had just dreamed of had committed suicide the day before. So of course I was like, whoa, I just had a dream about her. I told my sister all about it. I made her ask her ex-husband if there was any kind of baby involved. To everyone's shock, he told my sister that in her note, she had admitted she was pregnant. So of course my sister told her ex about my dream and she said she felt it brought him some comfort, thinking that she and her baby were at peace now from such a conflicted and difficult life. I wasn't really sure why she would come through my psyche as opposed to anyone else's, especially someone who knew her better but I have seen ghosts since I was eight, and I've had a few kind of paranormal or spiritual experiences in my life, so maybe I'm just the one that's most open to that kind of thing. Has anyone else had people that have passed away come through in their dreams? To add to her tragic story, her boyfriend had just been killed in a hit and run accident while he was on the side of the road working on his car about a month prior. The whole thing was just so sad. I know it was a dream, but I like to think she really did find peace, that they both did, and that somewhere they're okay. When I was about four years old, my great-grandpa gave me a soft clown doll for Christmas. It had long, noodly arms and legs, and it was about the same length as me. I liked clowns at the time. The 80s were a different time, and I was a bit of a strange kid anyway. So I never thought about them in any kind of negative way. I used to lay it down parallel with me in bed, between me and the wall, and would usually wake up to find it on the floor as I usually turn over and am generally restless during the night. One morning, I woke up, laying on my left-hand side facing into the room and my back facing toward the wall. I woke up aware of some movement behind me, out of the corner of my right eye. So I turned my head slowly to see that this thing was sitting up from the waist and had its head turned almost right around so it was looking down at my face. Its head was flicking slightly from side to side, in the same way that people do when they look at different parts of your face. I didn't understand what was happening, beyond knowing that this wasn't right, so I started to sit up and turn to face it. As I did, its head turned back, and it lowered itself slowly back down to the bed, until it was just laid there staring at the ceiling and lifeless again. I know I wasn't pushing it against the wall or moving it in any way. My own hand could have been doing it from an angle, but seeing as both hands were in front of me, I don't think that was the case either. It was daylight and morning. It just wasn't right. I threw the thing across the room and ran to my parents' bedroom. Nothing happened with it again or any other toys after that. My great-grandpa was still alive at that point, so it's not like he was haunting me. I'm pretty sure nobody will believe this story because it sounds like a scene out of a movie. It's easy to say that I must have just remembered it wrongly or been mistaken, but I know what I saw and I'll never forget it because it forever changed the way I look at everything.
Years ago, I worked at a mall. I was assigned the evening shift, so there was never that much action. I would usually come into work and just read a book or call some of my old friends to see how they were doing. The fun of this job all changed eventually. One evening, my manager decided to come in and keep me company. My manager and I developed a close friendship. I was leaning against the counter talking to her, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black shadow man dash right by me, heading to the back of the store. The back of the store is locked, so nobody can gain entrance or exit through that way. I asked my manager if she saw it, and she did not. I searched the whole store to find nobody and nothing weird. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me. Another night, I was working by myself when I heard a loud bang. The store I worked in was one of those mystery room games where people would solve clues to break out, like an escape room. One of the themes of the room was special ops, so the loud bang was from a military helmet prop. I realized that some things may fall, but this object was tightly secured on a shelf. Plus, military helmets are not the lightest of objects. It's not like they get blown off. Another night when I was working there alone, I was reading a book by my favorite author, Stephen King. I believe the book was It. Very faintly, I heard my name called. Again, I looked all through the store and nobody was there. I thought I was just a crazy person. About an hour later, I felt a hand on my shoulder and the hand exerted some force. This freaked me out. I closed the store about an hour early and went home. All the activity got quiet for a few months and I started working the morning shifts. My manager asked me to come in early so I could reset some of the rooms from the previous night. About 30 minutes into my shift, I get a phone call from a strange but normal looking number. I picked up the phone and all I heard was static for a while. Very faintly, I could hear a man talking. Then all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a robot, like in the movies, say my name and hang up. I legit thought I was losing my mind at this point. On my last day of work before leaving for university, I was saying goodbye to my coworker. She just casually mentions how lucky I am to leave this spooky place. I felt relieved because she shared similar stories to mine. About a year after I quit, somebody on a forum page asked if anybody had had experiences at this particular mall. I told them some of the same stories I just told you, and it turns out a lot of people there had weird experiences. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn just talking when dusk started to settle in. I told John that I had to be going or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember that it was just a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I look up and I notice a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he had been following me and I hadn't really questioned it. I asked if he saw it too, but as soon as I opened my mouth to ask, he was gone. I turned back and the figure stood in the same spot, so for some reason I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it, and suddenly I was able to make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure up close, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper, but it was unlike any iteration I had ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remember disturbing me most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness. 
and his teeth resembled those of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice, though it was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he said, you're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I woke up, and the only dream or thought that I've ever been absolutely compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Can't really explain why. Does anyone have any theories on what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend that was in the dream about it, and he thinks that it's connected to the time when I was around 14 and drowned in the reservoir. My brother pulled me out and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go and a peace coming over me before I blacked out, and then nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I'd been underwater for at least a few minutes before he had managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and I didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anyone else thinks this might be. During my childhood, I used to live in the city of Patna, Bihar. We used to live in a joint family. Back in 2006, my cousin's sister, I'll call her S, had relocated to Bangalore to attend her engineering college. S was always cheerful, respectful, and courteous. None of us could ever have imagined what was about to happen to her. One day, the doorbell rang and I went to open the door. When I opened it, I saw that S was standing there with a solemn look on her face. Our family ushered her in and asked her about her trip home, about 1,500 kilometers. She said that she had no recollection of the trip. We later found out that she had taken a flight home, although she claimed to have no idea she had done so. The next six months are as easy to recount as they were painful to live through. S started exhibiting signs of depression, although some in the family felt that there was something more sinister going on. She wouldn't talk to anyone. She wouldn't eat properly. At times, she would start burning up with a fever and scream for it to stop. At night, she would start laughing maniacally or sometimes wail and tear her hair out. If someone tried to console her, she'd outpour a filthy barrage of abuses in this gruff, animalistic voice. Since my other sister is a psychiatrist, she promptly diagnosed her with depression stemming from low self-esteem while in college and started a course of medication. The medication was administered to her regularly for six months, but her condition never improved. My maternal aunt and uncle had reached a breaking point and they decided to seek the help of a master tantric, an occult practitioner, and honestly, they would have done just about anything to get their daughter back. The tantric in question was supposed to be extremely clairvoyant and adept at the occult sciences. When he entered our home, S began to scream and wail at the mere sight of him. The tantric just stared at her for a while, and then told us he would be going home to perform the exorcism ritual, and we should ensure that S didn't leave the house during that time. After exactly three hours, S again started to scream, although this time she tried to run out of the house. It took four or five of the biggest guys in our family to pin her down to the bed so she wouldn't run out. She still tried jumping out of the window. Her screaming brought the entire neighborhood out who gathered around the house to watch the spectacle. After about an hour, she fell completely silent and slept like a baby for six hours. When she woke up, she calmly asked us what she was doing in her home and why she wasn't at the college hostel where she was supposed to be. She had turned completely normal, except that she had no memory of the last six months. My maternal uncle and aunt met the tantric and asked him what had happened to their daughter. 
The tantric nonchalantly replied that somebody had put a lower class of Muslim spirit called a jinn on her. He said that the spirit was induced inside her through first attaching the spirit to a hair, which was then mixed in biryani, a traditional Muslim rice dish, and fed to her. He also told them he knew the identity of the person who did it, but he wasn't allowed to reveal it to them. My uncle then went home and carefully asked S about the last thing she remembered from college without giving her any information about what the tantric had said. She told them that she had this Muslim friend who was in love with her and had proposed to her a few months ago. She wasn't interested in him and politely refused his advances. The guy begged her to remain friends, and she agreed. She said her very last memory was the day of Aid when the Muslim guy had invited her for lunch and served her biryani. She couldn't recollect anything after that. My aunt refused to let her go back to college after that. She continued her education in a local college and later moved to the US and is living a normal life. We do avoid any mention of what happened to her though. Sometimes it triggers pretty bad memories. The following case was narrated during a famous radio program called La Mano Peluda, The Hairy Hand, around 2001. A civil engineer, who wishes to remain anonymous, shares his story. This happened in Tepotzatlan, Mexico City. When I was studying, I met my wife at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, where she studied medicine. When we got married, my father-in-law gave me a piece of land in Tepotzatlan, where we decided to build a house. Little by little, we were building the home, and when it was finished, we decided to have a celebration with friends and family. The party transcended without eventualities. However, when everyone had retired, at dawn we heard strange noises inside the house, like laments, dragging chains, strong blows, etc. This worried my wife a lot, and as a strong believer, she prayed for protection. I used to be kind of skeptical of these things, and I didn't give it any importance, always trying to find a logical explanation. On one occasion, I went to work, and my wife called me on my cell phone, asking me about a pair of mining boots that she found near the basement. I usually wear this type of footwear due to my work in construction, but it seemed strange to me since I only had one pair and I was wearing them at work at the time she called. Upon arriving to the house, I found my wife somewhat worried, and when looking for these boots, I found them just at the entrance to the basement over a puddle of water. None of this had a reason to exist, since the boots were not mine and there was no water leak that could justify the large puddle that was there. At first I thought they were from one of my subordinates and that he had possibly forgotten them there, but looking at them carefully, they were not the type of boots or brand that we usually use, so not knowing who they belonged to, I threw them away. After that day, the wailing and the noises became louder and louder until the point that I got used to them. However, my wife spent terrible, horrified nights praying. For this reason, I decided to buy a firearm a 45 pistol for anything that came along. On one occasion, we went to my nephew's christening and returned to the house late at night. But since we were already tired, we went to bed to go to sleep. The main bedroom is located on the second floor and to get there, there's a wooden staircase that creaks when you step. In the early morning, the creaking woke me up and I got very nervous. Then the creaking stopped. I prepared my weapon, thinking that it was a thief, and suddenly, someone started punching on the door as if it wanted to break it down, giving me the impression that this intruder had enormous strength. At this point, my wife woke up abruptly, and I, with weapon in hand, instructed her to lock it as soon as I left to confront the stranger. I opened the door suddenly, and clearly saw a man descending the stairs in a hurry when he saw that I was armed. I emptied the gun, hitting him more than five times in the back, and I watched him roll down the stairs. 
Call the police, I yelled to my wife. Then I ran to turn on the stair light. But to my surprise, there was no one. Instead, what sat there on the stairs were those boots that I had thrown away months ago. But this time, over a pool of blood. My wife was so scared that she called a priest to bless the house. I personally set the boots on fire until they turned to ash in front of me. For some time, things seemed to be normal, so much so that we decided to have children. And to make my wife feel calmer, we took one of her uncles into the home. Her uncle was an old man who, due to an accident at work, had been disabled, but his company made her feel good. Everything was going along well, so I dared to work out of state without concern. More than three months had passed since the last incident. It was already dark when I returned home after a work trip. My assistant and another trusted employee were with me. Upon arriving at the house, I was surprised to find the lights off. At first I thought they had just gone out, but I listened to the television and it was on. I moved over to the living room to see what was happening. I found my wife's uncle out of his chair. He was dead and immediately I was alarmed. I began to scream for my wife. I finally found her hidden to one side of the dining room, sitting in a large pool of blood, sobbing uncontrollably. Thinking someone had hurt her, I called emergency services. The paramedics immediately took my wife away, confirming that she was fine, but that she had lost her baby. Upon checking the uncle, they just confirmed his death. They said that it was due to cardiac arrest, but his face reflected absolute terror. Had it not been for my assistant and the other worker accompanying me and serving as witness, the police probably would have accused me of harming my wife and killing her uncle, as they found nothing that suggested the entry was forced. There was no evidence of a stranger in our home. My wife spent three weeks in intensive care until she finally began to show improvement. When she woke up, due to the trauma, she had lost her memory. She doesn't even remember me. I have taken her to psychiatrists. Even with hypnosis, we've tried to make her remember. But as soon as she begins to relive what happened, she becomes completely hysterical. She'll just say, here it comes. Here comes the one who will harm us. Take care of him. We've never been able to find out who he is, what he is, or what he wants. Due to the state of her health, I was forced to confine her to a psychiatric hospital in Guadalajara City. I visit whenever possible, although she doesn't remember me. She believes that I am a friend. After everything was over, I returned to the house, and the first thing I saw when I opened the door were those damned boots in a pool of blood next to the basement. Since then, I haven't returned to the house, which is, to date, uninhabited as it has been completely impossible for me to sell it. This spring, I took a trip with six other friends of mine. Throughout this trip, all of us except for one kept having strong feelings that we were missing a person when we weren't. A few examples that I can remember. We would have the cars packed up and ready to go, but nobody was leaving because we thought we were missing someone, like they were in the bathroom or at the campsite. But then we would realize that everyone was present. A different night, we were sitting by the fire. Six of us were around the fire and one person was at the picnic table, maybe 10 feet away so I was fully aware of where they were, when I suddenly got a strong feeling that someone was missing. But I physically counted how many people we had and all seven were present. Lastly, we had dealt a round of cards. All seven of us were sitting at this table, but we didn't start the game because we were waiting for someone until somebody finally said something like, oh, everyone's here. <laughs> I thought we were missing somebody to which all of us but one said that we had also felt that way. I'm not a super big believer in the paranormal or glitches or anything like that, but this was straight up bizarre. The only somewhat explanation I have is that our friend group does have more than seven of us in it, but we all knew how many were on the trip. 
I remember specifically feeling that someone was missing. Not a specific person, just an absence that we all felt even though there wasn't one. I couldn't figure out who it was that I thought wasn't there, and no one else could either. Maybe it was just a weird thing, but it definitely felt strange, and I still don't know what happened. One time, my mom and I were going out for lunch. We have two dogs, one that's 100 pounds and another that's 50 pounds, so they aren't small. My mom told me to let them outside before we left. They were gonna stay out there and play, use the bathroom and all that while we were gone, so I did. An hour later, we get back and our dogs are not outside. Okay, I thought maybe I didn't let them out even though I know I did. We check the house, which is one story and about a thousand square feet, so not huge. Nothing. Well, maybe they are outside and they just aren't coming to us. There are plenty of hiding spots in our backyard, with two sheds, a lot of trees, and a sectioned off area that we call the squirrel yard. We once had a pet squirrel, but that's another story. The dogs can't get into the squirrel yard, so I go outside searching everywhere for them. Nothing. Well, now we're considering the fact that somehow our dogs got out. So we check the perimeter of our yard. We have a six foot privacy fence, so our dogs cannot jump it, but they have been known to dig holes under it. Here's the thing, no holes, none. Absolutely no way that they could have squeezed under that fence. So now we're thinking somebody stole our dogs. Our 100 pound dog looks like a pit bull mix, so it would make sense that they would get stolen because of dog fights and stuff like that. And maybe they took the 50 pound one for similar reasons. But the thing is, they would have had to climb the privacy fence because the fence is padlocked and the locks were still in place. And even if they did that, how would they get these dogs over the fence? The short answer, nobody could do that. So we nixed that idea and turned to checking our house locks. Maybe they came inside. Nah, everything was locked, even the windows. Well, maybe the dogs are inside and they're hiding. We checked everywhere, under the beds, in the closets, even in rooms that were closed off. Nothing. I go back outside and I end up taking the grate off from our access point to the crawl space. I crawl around under the house. They aren't there. Our last bet is to go search the neighborhood, and even though there is logically no way that they could have gotten out, we still go. We leave the house, all the doors locked per usual, and we begin searching. Nothing. An hour later, we come home, dejected, planning our next move. I'm about to go into the crawl space again when I hear my mom shouting for me. There, Laying in their beds, sound asleep, were our dogs. No one else has keys to our house. No locks were broken. All windows were shut and locked. There's no logical way for our dogs to have left our property and suddenly reappear. And they were totally fine. One of them is scared of everything, so it would have made sense for him to be freaking out if something had happened, but nope. This took place over the course of three hours from the time we got home to when they magically reappeared. We still can't figure out how our dogs just disappeared, where they went, or how they got back. I don't know if it's some glitch in the matrix or what, but we were pretty freaked out. This happened in Daytona Beach, Florida in 2012. It was the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in high school. A little background. My grandparents lived in Florida at the time, close-ish to Daytona, but not in Daytona. We decided to take a vacation within a vacation and spend a weekend at a hotel in Daytona. 
When we got there, for whatever reason, my grandparents decided that they didn't want to stay and that they would come pick up my mom and I at the end of the weekend since they only lived about an hour away. My mom and I asked them to please drop us off at Joe's Crab Shack for dinner and said we would walk back to our hotel. Somehow, we completely misjudged how far away the restaurant was from our hotel, so it ended up being this insanely long walk. We were expecting it to be about two to three miles, but it ended up being more like six or seven. On the way back to the hotel, it got dark on us. There was enough light from the street to be able to see pretty decently, but to get up to the street, we would have to go through an alleyway, and we just didn't feel comfortable with that. So we decided to stay on the beach. Now, I want to say, even though it was dark, there was a full moon and enough light from the street that whenever we passed a person, we could clearly make out their face if we were close enough. So while the dark may have played a small factor in this, I don't think it was enough of a factor to make me just dismiss the experience. So as we're walking, we see a light headed toward us about six-ish feet off the ground. We weren't too concerned because it looked like somebody going the opposite direction as us wearing a headlamp, maybe taking a nighttime stroll on the beach. As the light got closer, we noticed that it was extremely steady, not like somebody walking, and especially not like somebody walking on sand. As it got close to us, this is what we saw. A cloaked figure wearing a brown monk-like cloak with a large hood. It was not walking, but just gliding along. In fact, there were no visible feet. There was a light shining out from under the hood of the cloak, but there was no face. Except for the light, it appeared to be completely black inside, almost like an empty cloak floating through the air without a person inside it. It didn't seem to notice us and just glided on past. My mom and I remember this event exactly the same way. I'm a very scientific person, but I still can't really explain this, as it was definitely light enough that we should have seen a face and feet, but we didn't. Has anybody else come across something like this? What do you think it was? I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campground. So if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew that I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of as well, and one that was about two and a half hours way up a windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, sleeping outside with no tent for the uninitiated, and he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but there was no one and nothing there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe that he was telling the truth. Now for my story. I've had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double-wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still, 
and I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I kept saying no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I was frozen. It was sort of a demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving, while they continued to yell at me. Eventually, it stopped, and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day, and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but somehow I knew that he wasn't, and asking the question was just too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but it was still scary. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home and I was about 13 years old. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here besides the odd being watched feeling that I would experience. My mom has hired my biological father, whom I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at that house. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I came to learn that my stepfather had a lot of problems and was sleeping with prostitutes, some younger than his own children. His oldest daughter was 30, and he was sleeping with prostitutes that were about a decade younger. I found this very concerning. Of course, he was cheating on my mom, and also just the behavior in general, and some other details that I won't get into that I experienced with him. But it was very evident that this guy had some real serious problems, and he gave me the creeps. I told my mother and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that she knew exactly what was going on. I wanted to get away from him and everything that he does, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and so I moved down there and was living on my own. He had most of the items and furniture from his old home in this home that I was staying at. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed alone in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was scared shitless and I couldn't sleep after that. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems, so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bathroom as well as the master bedroom and the closet there. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that room, and I was frightened to be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I felt like I was being watched again. And then I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped up and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds later, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was so frozen in fear that I stood up at my desk, and all I could do was scream. I called my mother, hysterical, and explained to her what had happened, and two days later she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I had found out that she was divorcing my stepdad and sending him to the house in Arizona that I had just come from. 
After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside the same feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home, with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of it, growling, completely frozen. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I haven't experienced anything like that since. I'm wondering if anybody might have an explanation as to what occurred, paranormal or otherwise. I believe this may have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything at all until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lived in. Ever since I was a child, I've gotten random snippets of deja vu. These episodes last from a few seconds to a minute. Whenever I have them, though, I always get the sense that what just happened was something I had dreamt about. I don't have particularly vivid dreams often, and I rarely remember the details when they are vivid. The real-life occurrences trigger the feelings of deja vu, but when I think about it logically, I know that it's not something I've experienced before, but rather something from a dream, or maybe an alternate reality or something that my mind just interprets as a dream. I'm not sure what to make of it, and I've never told anyone else about this. I guess I just want to know that I'm not alone. I was about 11, and I was just laying in my bed, but the way my bed was positioned in my room made it so that I could look straight down the hallway, as in the bottom of my bed faced the door, and my head was near a wall. Anyway, I was laying there, and I was trying to go to sleep, when I heard a door open. So I looked down the hallway, and all I saw was a completely nude woman standing down at the end of the hallway staring at me. She was kind of a pretty woman. She had long, dark hair, and I could even see her pale blue eyes. She was probably in her late twenties or early thirties. She was moving closer and closer to me. I was already afraid because there was this strange naked woman in my house, but what was even weirder is that her legs weren't moving. They weren't even touching the ground. The weirdest part, though, is that the closer she got to me, the older she looked. By the time she was at my door, she was hunched over, had gray hair that looked like it had never been brushed, wrinkled skin, and all the other features of an old woman that you would expect. As soon as she entered my room, she started screaming at me, which scared me, so I pulled the blankets above my head. I closed my eyes, but when I pulled the blankets off, I didn't see anything. If anyone has ever experienced something like this, or you know what kind of entity this was, please let me know. I've seen spirits all of my life. I interact with human ones. I've seen the spirits of some of my deceased pets, but last week I saw something different. I work more than one job, but one has a stockroom. It is on land leased from one of several local tribes. It was tribal land for centuries before there was a highway built through the center of it in a mountain pass. In the stock area, we have racks that can be rolled. These are called lundias. About a year ago, I confided in a friend that there were in fact some odd spirits there. My friend asked me if I had seen the ones in the stock room. He said they were some sort of gremlin-like shadows 
and that he had seen them at night. I did not see or sense any of them for a long time. When I saw some last week, I remembered his comments. They are odd. They're black, shadowy things. They're different, about two and a half to three feet long. They run in the Lundias, low to the ground. A former co-worker asked me over two years ago if I had seen them running through the nearby desert. I told her I had never seen anything like them, but I have seen them now. They are hunched over at the spine, so their heads are lower than their backs. Their backs are rounded. The vertebrae are fairly well defined. They don't expect to be seen. They're sort of coyote-like, and sort of dog-like, as if they were the victims of some terrible spinal disease. They have dark fur or hair on the spine, thinning to bare skin on the bellies. Their legs are bent at the knees like dogs, in the back, and bent at the knees in the front. Their faces are dog-like with canine-style teeth. I know they have been there for many, many centuries. Some sort of nature spirits, maybe? Either way, I don't plan to bother them at all. Last night, I had a really weird experience. I was laying down, ready to fall asleep, but still fully awake. My boyfriend turned on the noise machine that he has so he could fall asleep. He always does this, and it's never bothered me before. However, not too long after he turned on the machine, I started hearing a sequence of individual tunes that eventually became a melody. It's like a sound that starts and stops. First, I thought that he had changed the machine itself, or that the sound coming out of the machine was different. I asked him if he could hear the music, and he said no. He asked me what it sounded like, and he still couldn't hear it, even when he was intentionally listening for it. Then he changed the sound, and I stopped hearing the first melody. And a few minutes later, I started hearing a new one. I asked him again, and he said he couldn't hear anything but I was hearing something completely different. This time it sounded almost like a symphony, but with very few instruments. Then he turned the machine on and off a couple of times, and finally, he told me he could hear something. He said that he could hear small pitches when the machine was on, but it was completely different from what I was hearing, as this was a third distinct and different melody that I was hearing. He eventually turned the machine off, but I could still hear melodies all night long. I never figured out what that was. This was not a dream. I was fully awake but I was having a hard time trying to go to sleep. I was in my room, but I couldn't fall asleep there, so I moved to the living room. Usually, as I'm trying to go to sleep, I'll let my mind wander on its own, and I always end up thinking of nonsense, like sentences or scenarios that don't mean anything. This time was different, though. I can almost always control the thoughts and steer them into the direction I want them to go, but this time I couldn't. It's like my thoughts were not my own. My mind was just racing with random sentences that I would never be able to think of. I had my eyes closed, but suddenly every thought racing through my head just stopped on a dime, and I hear a high-pitched female voice scream, someone is home. She said a name, but I couldn't make it out. It seriously sounded like it was being yelled directly into my ear and it turned into an echo chamber in my brain. I heard it replay over and over and over until it faded out. All of this happened in maybe five seconds, but it felt like I'd heard it 15 times. 
I lifted my head up off the couch to see who was there, but it was no one. So I decided to try to go to sleep again, and as soon as I closed my eyes, all I could see was dirt, a field, and eight blue orbs. I'm still awake at this point, and out of nowhere, I hear the voice again, this time inside of my head, saying, eight people died here. I'm really not sure what to think of this. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I used to experience sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming quite often, but not like this. With everything I was hearing and seeing, I felt like it was completely out of my control. It was so weird. I had a lot of creepy experiences as a child, but I never truly realized how unnatural they were until I got older. The first of many weird experiences was when I was six. This one by far was probably the creepiest and scariest one I can recall. It was your average night, I don't remember anything from earlier that day. I was upstairs in the bathroom having just cleaned up before dinner. I opened the door to exit the bathroom into the upstairs hallway. Now, the way my house is laid out is when you exit the bathroom, you come into the small hallway. At the end of the hallway is the door to the attic, and to the right of that is my parents' master bedroom. The minute I look down the hall, I'm about to turn out the bathroom light, and that's when it happened. There was a figure at the end of the hall, in front of the attic door, it was a completely blacked out shadow person, but he looked exactly like my dad. Same height, same build, same everything. Just without any discernible features or details. Except for one thing. My dad wore glasses. As I'm looking at it, this thing did as well. But the area where the clear lenses would be were completely white. They also had no discernible details except for the shape. I was thinking to myself, why would my father be upstairs? And that's when my blood ran cold, because I could hear my father yelling to my mom from downstairs. She was making dinner in the kitchen. I instantly knew that this wasn't my dad. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. It was like this thing took control over my whole body. The next thing I know, I'm walking back into the bathroom, and I rested my head on the towel rack. The only thing I can remember after that was my mother calling me from downstairs. I am now 20 years old, but I can still remember this horrifying experience vividly to this day. I've always wondered what that thing was, and why it looked like my dad. I started recording my sleep a month ago to hear myself sleep talk, but haven't really heard myself. However, yesterday morning I came across a very strange voice clearly saying, wake up, at 4.30. It's definitely not me, as I'm a female and the voice is very deep. My partner was in the spare room that night, and you can hear no entrance into the room previous to the recording which you can hear with other recordings on the app where we enter or leave the bedroom, no matter how quiet we are. I have no idea what this could be. Nothing was heard after this, apart from me possibly moving around, and then when I woke up a few hours later. Now I'm scared, especially as we've had some weird things happening in our house. Also, just some answers to some questions or assumptions I know I'll get. My partner pranking me. It could be that. I started using the app as my partner told me that I sleep talk. I hadn't really heard much in the month that I was using it, so I stopped using it for a couple of weeks. Therefore, he had no idea I was recording on this night. My partner is a terrible prankster and always ends up laughing. Even he's a bit freaked out. Me pranking. 
Definitely not. Like my partner, I'm not good at holding it out. And also, I would probably come up with something a little bit better. Another assumption is that it's my voice, but it's too low to be mine, and it sounds robotic. When I've heard myself sleep talk on this app in the past, it sounds nothing like it. According to Fitbit, at this time I wasn't dreaming, so I couldn't have been sleep talking. Although I accept that this isn't exactly the most highly accurate data. It's not a noise coming from outside, either. It's too clear. Noises from farther away sound, well, farther away, and the phone is right next to me on the bedside table. We have no idea what said it. I lost my very brilliant, witty, overachieving son to opioids almost five years ago. He was extremely intelligent, had a high IQ, was a gifted student who graduated college in three years. He was self-sufficient with a great job and had a very dark, terrible secret. He became addicted to pills in college and managed to hide it for four years. He didn't smoke and rarely drank. I found out about his addiction just five weeks before his death, and I was able to get him into treatment. He would only stay there eleven days, and I was with him at his apartment the last six days of his life. On November 10th, 2014, he gave me two red roses. He said, because you deserve these, mom. And I then dropped him off at an AA meeting. But he didn't go to the meeting. He was found 45 minutes later unresponsive in a PetSmart bathroom with a needle in his arm. Since his death, and I can't remember exactly when it started, I have had roses come into my life time and time again in many different forms. I moved to Portland, the Rose City. I adopted a cat. She was already named Rosie. I decided to start photographing two roses which appear frequently. I swear if anybody could figure out how to reach beyond the other world, it would be my brilliant son. They appear randomly and also on important dates. His birthday. My birthday. Mother's Day. For example, on his birthday in 2016, I was at a thrift store the night before, feeling sad and like a loser, really. I frequently beat myself up over losing my son the way I did. As I was leaving, I saw two red roses in a glass display case. It stopped me in my tracks, and as I looked at it, I saw a little note. Pull my pin close to you. It was a music box. As I wound it up and pulled the pin, it played Close to You by the Carpenters. On the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to create a dream come true. A song about a birthday. Of course I bought it. I planted a red rose bush for my son when I moved to Portland in 2015. It has struggled and has never really produced much. Last year, in 2018, I noticed that it had two buds. The bush produced two perfect red roses, side by side, that bloomed from Mother's Day to my birthday. It produced no other flowers that year. So odd. My other roses had dozens of blooms. I have countless other signs, sometimes roses, sometimes other unexplained events that leave me wondering. At any rate, this is my story. We had a few things happen in our old house. We lived there for 13 years, a mid-terraced Victorian house in the United Kingdom. My partner has two sons that used to come over on the weekend to stay. The youngest would never walk down the hall on the ground floor by himself to go to the toilet because he said he didn't like it. We used to think it was just because it was a dark house. You'd have to leave the living room walk down a hall that had a little dog leg before you got to the kitchen, 
and then into the bathroom. He wasn't bothered about the kitchen. It was just the hall he didn't like. That just happened all the time, and we would just moan that he wouldn't go to the toilet, but we would walk him through the hall anyway, trying to convince him that it was fine, and that it was just an old house. We also used to have our PC desk under the stairs. It was open to the hall, but it was a nifty little space to work from. I was making dinner one night and chopping something when I saw my partner pop his head round the door from my peripheral vision. I knew he was working at the PC and thought, what does he want? So I walked down to the door and asked him. He looked really confused, so I told him what had just happened. He swore that he hadn't moved from the spot. I believed him because of his reaction. I have no idea who it was, but it was the head and shoulders of a man, and it was so domestic, that's why I was positive it was my partner to start with. A few months later we were redecorating, and the stairs were boxed in with plywood. We had thought it looked pretty ugly for such an old house, so he pulled it all down. The next thing we both felt was a fresh air breeze building up. No doors or windows were open. We joked around, saying it was the spirit trying to get out, and he opened the front door and said goodbye. The weird thing was that his son started going to the toilet all by himself after that happened. He never said anything else about the hallway, and had no issues with it. We're pretty realistic and have a healthy skepticism, but that was a little bit odd. That whole place was a little bit odd. So my boyfriend and I were staying at my grandma's house for about a week. We both like late night walking, so I decided to take him out on one and show him what it's like at my grandma's. He's used to the city, and my grandma's house is in the middle of nowhere. We ended up walking a direction that I never go, and we had walked for a few minutes before we hit a field clearing on either side of the road. We were talking when all of a sudden we heard coyotes toward the back part of the fields and mountains. I told him they move fast and that we should probably turn back and get back to the house. We did, but it seemed like the moment we turned to walk back, they began to close in. Within a matter of seconds, they seemed to be right behind us and were closing the distance fast. We began to panic and power walk and then jog because they sounded like they were in a frenzy. After a minute or two of fear and adrenaline, the sound died to a near silence. Almost home, a dog ran out in front of us wanting attention. However, as soon as I went to pet him, he seemed to notice something and immediately positioned himself behind us toward the coyote area we had just left and began barking and growling. We took it as our cue and booked it the rest of the way home, with his frantic barks in the background. When we made it back, my boyfriend wanted to sit on the steps to see if they had tracked us all the way back. We sat for a moment, before everything went silent. All of a sudden, a low, deep, growling noise filled the air. It was everywhere, all at once, like a jet taking off. It began to get louder as an ice-cold chill ran straight down my back. We both looked at each other for a second before I spoke up and told him something wasn't right and we needed to go in now. We darted in the house and locked the doors, done exploring for the night. The coyotes are normal for our area and we're on their normal trail, but what made them go silent and stop tracking us? What was the dog so frantic about? And more importantly, what was that sound? Mm -hmm. 
My father's house is a creepy one. It isn't secluded, as we had many neighbors, but it was by no means in a suburb, if you get what I mean. This story is about my father's first experience, and also my first experience with the paranormal. My father is a skeptical man when it comes to the paranormal. Skeptical meaning that if something is explainable, he won't bother with it. That fact is what makes everything I'm about to tell you so much more terrifying. As he used to work graveyard shift for the school district in our town, he would sleep during the day. Back when this incident happened, we only had a cheap futon for a couch. The futon had a metal frame with a dingy cover as the cushion portion of it. And the back of the futon, when locked up into a couch, had vertical, hollow bars. He told me that one day, while everyone was away at either work or school, he was having trouble sleeping and was awake for about an hour before being able to fall back asleep. He told me that while he was laying there trying to convince himself to sleep, he heard someone open our front door, but he never heard it close. It's a finicky door, so you have to slam it to get it actually closed. Essentially, he would have had to have heard someone close it. He had a reason to believe it was his girlfriend, now ex, coming home from work early for lunch and he thought nothing of it. While he's waiting for her to come to the bedroom, he suddenly hears heavy footsteps walk around what he believes is our living room and slowly run their fingers, theoretically, across the back of our futon. This is where the description earlier comes in. What he thought was fingers ran across the back of the futon. There's a distinct metallic thunk, thunk, thunk when someone does this. It's not mistakable for anything else in the house. It's the only object that could make that sound. He immediately thinks that it's an intruder and rushes into the living room, but no one is there. The door is wide open and nobody's anywhere in the house. I should also mention that we have a deck made of wood that has a flight of stairs leading down to the ground level. Also, the walls are paper thin. You can hear anything from one place in the house to another. I can hear my father sneeze when he's in his room while I'm in the living room. This means that he would have had to have heard, or at least seen, somebody walk out the front door and down the stairs to leave the house, and he did not. This experience had him on edge for months. He tried talking to whatever manifested in the house and taking pictures of it, just to get some sense of closure from that day. As for my encounter, when I was a teenager, my sisters and I would hang out in our bathroom to talk and whatnot. Don't ask why, it was a thing for us for some reason. One particular day, one of my sisters and I were in there talking to each other when we heard somebody sprinting down the hall. It's a very short hallway, so it didn't phase us when it stopped abruptly at the end of the hall. We were on edge, as we thought it was our younger sister and we didn't want to get in trouble. As mentioned, my father worked nights and he would be upset when woken up while sleeping. So I open the door and as soon as I do, this huge gust of wind hits me in the face. Like, you know, if someone's running past you. I look out into the living room and see my father's now ex sitting on the futon watching television. I asked her where my sister was and she pointed next to her and motioned that she was sleeping. I asked if she had just heard that running and she gave me a funny look. As my heart sank, I slowly closed the door and looked at my sister, who was frozen with fear. We both knew what it was, and didn't really mention it for a while. We didn't want to make the story feel any more real than it already did. I always get random intrusive thoughts at night when everything is quiet and I can't sleep. They're thoughts composed of words I sometimes don't even say or know the meaning to, 
and they just pop into my mind without any prior thoughts related to them. Often, they lead me to have to look up definitions. I'm legitimately afraid that some sort of frequency wave is intruding on my mind and manipulating my cognitive functioning. Also, sometimes when I nod out at night, when I'm tired but I'm trying to stay awake, as soon as I nod out but am still mostly conscious, I'll hear fragments of a voice making a sound. Sometimes it will say my name. And one time I didn't even nod out and to the right of me I heard the name of my boyfriend out loud. I swear my house is haunted by some kind of energy. My father died here 11 years ago by killing himself. I was the last one to enter his bedroom where he passed to shut the windows because it was storming heavily outside before leaving to spend the night at my grandmother's house. I was very close to my dad and took after him in many ways, features and all. However, years before he passed, I was very resentful and nothing but mean and nasty to him. Literally minutes before he passed, I gave him a dirty look, for no reason. Flash forward 11 years, and I've found myself exactly where he was before he died. Isolated, depressed, and addicted to opioids. At first I thought I was haunted by him, but maybe there's a dark energy that followed him throughout his life, and now it's attached to me. I just feel so haunted here all the time, alone in my mom's basement. Late at night when everything is quiet, around midnight until 4 o'clock when the sun is just about to rise and the birds start chirping, I always feel a strong presence around me, and sometimes my lamp and bedroom lights will glow brighter and cause all the shadows in my room to become darker and darker. It's creepy. And to make my mom's house even creepier, it's full of my grandmother's old furniture from the 50s and 60s. Everything is old with weird energies attached. Everyone that I've asked who's come over to my house has told me that they feel a very strange and dark and sinister energy here. We moved into it newly built and it's only about 14 years old now, so I really don't know what's going on. I've always had a belief in the unknown and spirits, but I had never really experienced anything from the unknown other than the typical deja vu we all experience from time to time. And then, high school happened. I have two stories about my own personal experiences. They are true events, even if people are skeptical. I know what I saw. I know what I felt. Believe whatever you want to believe, or believe what will help you sleep at night. But either way, these are true. Before I get into the stories, it's probably worth pointing out that I used to use Ouija boards with one of my friends. Stupid, I know. So when I was in high school, we lived in this neighborhood with an old textile mill in it. I always had a creepy vibe about the mill. I've never looked up if anything happened there because I've always been, and still am, afraid of what I might find. My bus stop used to be in front of the mill, and I had to start walking to school, because I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched by someone, or something, at the mill. Now, two things happened after I started walking to school. One, I started seeing a little girl out of the corner of my eye, about four or five in the mornings as I was getting ready for school. I was the only one awake at the time, so maybe she just felt comfortable appearing then. I never felt threatened by her, and I don't know her name, but she looked like she was maybe from the 20s. I actually stopped seeing her after a while, which made me kind of sad, even though her presence also sent a shiver down my spine. The second thing that happened was my brother and his friend decided to go in the mill where, according to them, they found markings where a body was and dried blood. I don't know how true that is because I refuse to go into that place, but I still can't ever shake the feeling that something is watching me, even to this day. 
In fact, I think it has intensified since my brother and his friend went in there. Apparently now it's being remodeled and reopened. I hope they cleansed that building of any negative energies and spirits first, but somehow I doubt it. My second story takes place a few years after the incident with the little girl at my sweet 16. My parents threw me a surprise party with a luau theme. I had a few of my close friends over, some staying overnight. One of my friends, let's call her Kat, needed to go home, so we all decided to walk her home. I mean, she didn't live that far, maybe two or three blocks at most. Well, we get there and we're all hanging out. Kat lived near a cemetery, and another friend who I'll call Sam suggested that we just walk around for a little bit. Now, it's maybe 9.30 at night. This cemetery has been known to have fog only in the cemetery. Fog that doesn't affect the area outside of its cobblestone walls. I didn't tell anyone, of course, and we all thought it would be a great idea. So we all hop over the wall, which really isn't that tall, and we just start walking around, looking at who's buried there. In this cemetery, there is an area that has its own fence, and after a while, Sam and I get a little bored and decided we wanted to go inside. So we did. And immediately, she starts feeling sick to her stomach, and we can't figure out why. So we tell everybody still in the cemetery, and we leave. The second we leave, Sam is feeling better. No nausea, no stomach pain, nothing. Then I started feeling nauseous, which freaked me out a little bit. So I convinced everyone to go back to my house because I didn't want to be around that place anymore. We told Kat goodbye and we left. I didn't stop feeling nauseous until we were inside my house. I don't think whatever was in there wanted us there. And I'm glad that all that ever happened to me was a wave of nausea. I assume it could have been a lot worse. I wanted to share an experience that my best friend and I had about three to four years ago. I'm 17 currently, and he is 18. At the time, we were both Christian, and this experience scared the living hell out of us. I was spending the night at his house, and his mom wanted us to walk their dog before it got too late. It was around 8 to 9 at night. This wasn't the first time that we had walked around at night. In my friend's neighborhood, there's this elementary school. We would always go there and let his dog run around on the field. We arrived at the school but we didn't feel like going on the field, so instead we decided to just walk around it. After passing the classrooms and the gym, we walked around the perimeter of the field, which has a chain link fence. I noticed that when we made a left toward the last stretch of fence, there were two people waiting on the curb across the street. We assumed it was just a couple out walking, but we couldn't really make them out except for dark, human-like figures. We got a little spooked and decided to pick up the pace, not walking fast, but definitely not as slowly as we were before. I turned around, and they were following us. I whispered to my friend, and he saw them about 20 feet behind us on the corner that we had just turned. At this point, we weren't just spooked, we were pretty scared. We started to fast walk down the sidewalk. When we made it to the end of the chain link fence, about 30 feet from where I turned and whispered to my friend, we noticed that they had already made it all the way down the sidewalk before the corner we turned and first saw them at. There's no way they could have turned and made it there in time, even sprinting. My friend's dog started to whine and we just decided to book it back to his place. This was the neighborhood he grew up in, and he knew a shortcut back to his house. The only other way to get to his home is to walk about two blocks on the main road. We were out of breath by the time we made it back, and we sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. We opened his front gate, 
and I turned around just to see if anything was there. Lo and behold, there were two black, human-like figures on the main road, walking toward the house. There's no way that any people could have made it there in time, even if they did know where to go. We ran inside, locked the door, and prayed to God that nothing would happen. We googled how to get rid of demons, prayers we could use, and so on. Nothing else happened that night. We talked to our pastor, and he told us about an experience with a demon that he had as a child. He told us to memorize certain prayers and to trust in God. Since then, I haven't really thought about it until I read some other stories. We have no idea what it was that night that followed us. All we knew was that we had to run away as fast as possible. It was October 26th of 2017. It was the night before season two of Stranger Things came out. As a huge fan, I was super excited and decided to stay up the whole night to watch all of it. I was half awake, half asleep, watching YouTube when I started hearing a light banging noise on the downstairs window. It was almost like a bird had flown into it and was flapping its wings against it. Keep in mind, I live in a heavily wooded area, so it's not that uncommon to have animals around your house at night. I just ignored it and figured it was a bird. About two to three minutes later, I hear three sets of three bangs, except it sounded more like a human doing it this time. I tried to listen to see if I could hear anything like talking or laughing. I hear nothing at all, like absolutely nothing. So I kind of just ignore it again. Time goes on, and again, two to three minutes later, more bangs. Except this wasn't like a bang that a human could do without tools. It sounded like the equivalent of someone banging a hammer against the side of my house. At this point, I am scared to death, and I'm thinking about calling the cops. But I decide I'm just going to wait, and if it happens one more time, I will. This time, it's at least five minutes before the next knocks. These were just like the last one, where it sounded like a hammer. Except this time, it was all around my house. It sounded like there were a hundred people banging all at once. The speed at which the bangs were happening was just not something a human could do. At that point, I decided to run to the kitchen to grab a knife. I grabbed my dog and ran up to my room, locking the door. I calmed down for a second and out of nowhere, my neighbor texts me, asking if I hear the banging too. So at this point, I know I'm not crazy. I decided to call 911 as the knocking was still happening. I'd say a minute later, the knocking stops and soon after, a few cops came and searched the entire house, yard, and a decent bit of the woods. They looked on the windows and siding for any sort of handprint or any sort of proof that somebody was knocking. Absolutely nothing. Now this is the part that really gets me. Earlier that night it was raining, so the ground was quite muddy. They looked for any sort of shoe print or even an animal print. Absolutely nothing. The only prints they found were their own. Years later, about two weeks ago actually, I was walking through the woods grabbing my motion-activated camera to check the footage. It's about 7 p.m., so it's by no means dark, but it's starting to get a little bit. I'm a decent way into the woods at this point, when I hear this god-awful noise. I don't even know what to call it. It was like a wailing, but it was so loud. It was like oohs and ahs and screeches all mixed together. It sounded like screaming, but higher and more intense. It was horrific. No human could make a noise like that. There was absolutely no way. After that, I hopped on my ATV and gunned it home, not looking back. No joke. When I got home, I checked my phone. 
and the same neighbor that had asked about the knocking years earlier asked me if I had heard screaming while I was in the woods. I have absolutely no idea what this could be, but I know it was real because I wasn't the only one that heard it, and I sure as hell don't want to run into it. I've had three UFO encounters. I'll tell them here. Number one. In the summer of 2011 or 2012, I was 12 years old, and my mom, my sister, and I were all driving out to California to drop my sister off at boarding school. I was sitting in the back seat doing whatever, when all of a sudden my mom says, hey, look up in the sky. You may never see this again in your life. When I looked up, I remember seeing this orange dot in the sky, just sitting there. Well, to me it looked like that, but my mom said that it followed us throughout the whole ride. People on the highway were slowing their cars down and looking out their windows to try to see what this thing was, when it suddenly let out this really bright flash and continued to hover. I still vividly remember seeing a plane fly by it as well. We called my brother, who was an astronomy enthusiast at the time, and tried to ask him what he thought it was that we were seeing, but he had no idea. Months later, I told a former science teacher of mine the story and asked what he thought of it. But he couldn't explain it either. Number two. This one takes place three years after the first event. By now, I was 15 and it was winter. I was getting ready for the night and already had my PJs on, when suddenly my mom said, Hey, want to see a UFO? I, being an enthusiast of the unknown, happily obliged and went outside. When I got there, I remember seeing these lights just hovering over our backyard. I remember seeing two, but my mom and stepdad said that there were three and that they were in a perfect triangle. I remember they kept changing color and we were all sitting out there trying to figure out what they were. From what I can recall, they had been out there for days. Finally, in 2016, I was 16 years old, and I was driving with a friend of mine back from camp. We were near our home when we saw this bright light just hovering. At first, I thought it was a helicopter, but he pointed out that it was too close to be that. As we got closer, we saw that it was triangular in shape. I told him to pull over and get a picture. We pulled over and I remember that it took him forever to eventually get the camera. By then, I was watching this thing and it was slowly moving away. When he finally got his camera together, it had already disappeared. This one could easily be explained as it could have been a military drone. We were close to some military base thing. But either way, it was still very interesting. When I was in the third or fourth grade, I saw a UFO with my older cousin and little brother. This was in Voorhees, New Jersey, during our summer vacation. We were in a high-end apartment complex and had gone outside to go play. This was in the late 90s. We had decided to first see who was out before deciding on what toys to bring out with us. Think water guns, bikes, scooters, Pokemon cards, things like that. We were going to go to the park first but heard a strange, high-pitched whistling noise down the hill from our apartment building near the mailboxes. It was the kind of whistling noise that brought about a strange energy. I noticed everything seemed really quiet, except for this whistling. I say whistling, but that's the closest sound we have in this world that people would collectively be able to understand. But it wasn't exactly whistling. It gave me the creeps. I wasn't scared, I just felt uneasy. 
My older cousin decided to go check it out. He ran down the hill and I saw him turn his head left and just stop dead in his tracks. I saw his jaw drop and his eyes go big. He said, oh my gosh, come look at this, it's a UFO. My brother and I were both younger and weary of him since he was known to be a prankster and mischievous. We didn't want to come and he was like, you won't regret it. He looked at us in such a way that I believed him, so I went down to go look as well. There was an apartment building blocking the view of the UFO, so I walked slowly to where I would pass it and be standing by my cousin. As I neared the location, this whistling noise became louder. I started to see the UFO floating and hovering right next to the balcony of a family we knew because they had older kids that would sometimes play with us. The UFO was about the size of a large pickup truck, and it was giant and metallic, but not a metallic ball. It was spinning really fast, and looked as if it should have been able to reflect its surroundings because it was so shiny, but it didn't. The whistling was this ball spinning so fast, yet so slowly as well. It had that saucer thing around it, but not huge or anything. Maybe the saucer it was spinning inside was only about three feet in width. But the UFO had to have had a diameter about the length of a Ford Tundra. I was in absolute awe. I felt like I'd won something. Like, yes, there's proof. And I know something that my parents don't know. My brother had been calling to us and I hadn't been paying attention. I just told him to come and look. He was always shy and a crybaby, but he came reluctantly. I was just observing this thing spinning and thinking that it had to be observing me too. I noticed in the sky there was like a tunnel of a spinning energy or clouds in the air. That tunnel went straight up into the sky and far away, and the UFO, or its copy, was on the other side way off in the distance. My cousin wanted to throw a rock at it and tell them to get out. My little brother screamed his panic scream and told him no. I also told him not to do that. He listened to us, but I guess they felt his hostility, and the UFO moved back and higher. My cousin said, see, they're scared, let's make them go, and he started screaming and saying go away and get out. My brother and I joined. I can't remember if we actually did start throwing rocks or not, but I don't think we did. That part gets murky. The tunnel looked like it got bigger in size, and the UFO started looking like it was appearing in the tunnel, even though it was right in front of us. It was like there was a delay, and we could see snapshots of the UFO in the tunnel going up, like a loading bar where it's copying itself. There was a loud sound like a whoosh and my little brother screamed and bolted home. The UFO was no longer in front of us, but the tunnel was still there, and we could see like a bright light and the UFO at the end of the tunnel, and then it was gone. We ran home to tell my mom. When we got there, my mom was pissed and thought that my cousin and I had tricked my brother and scared him. She couldn't quite understand through my brother's hysterical crying what he was saying, only heard that they made me see the aliens. We saw no aliens and we explained this to my mom. We explained what we saw and I said, Mom, it's real. I was the only girl and my mom believed me because I wasn't one to lie or prank. I used to keep a diary and I wrote this experience down. I forgot about it, and somehow it had felt like a dream over the years. We had moved to a new house, many strange things happened there. And something absolutely terrifying and awe-inspiring happened that made me check my diary. I had asked my brother if he remembered the UFO, and he said he did. He told me the story and it matched what was in my diary. We called my uncle and cousin and had my cousin retell his side of the story. Years later, all of our stories matched.
My stepdad was always a dry man. His humor was always what you would expect from someone born in the 1940s. He was devout in his faith as a Christian and hated superstition. It intrigued me then. In 2006, he confessed, and I say confess, because he tells his story in a tone that didn't really fit the mood of the night that he told us. We were all just eating dinner, talking about the Patriots football game. And that's when he tells me of a time that he took the train from Chicago to southern Wisconsin that stops in Kenosha. He was on the near-empty train, by himself, when he looks out the window and sees a frozen pond, very small, about ten feet from the train. He sees about a dozen small men in green outfits. Some have top hats. Some have pointed hats of red and gold. He was shocked. It was a traditional Midwest winter, lightly snowing. He was so shocked that he shared the experience with a random woman who was sitting across from him. She noticed it too, and the both of them watched in fascination and horror. They said that they were scared, that their train cart was so empty that nobody else seemed to notice. The train began to move, and they moved on. As a teenager, you can imagine my brothers and I asking many questions. In my rational mind, I thought perhaps it was an issue of scale. Maybe it appeared that they were short little men, but he said that it was so close to the train, and the pond was so small, that there was no issue in scale or perspective. He says that he knows he saw little gnomish men ice skating and doing acrobatics on a small little pond in the middle of winter. It's interesting because now that I'm nearly 30, my husband told me a story recently about when he was 19. He was playing Game Boy at 9 p.m. in bed, and a little man with a pointy hand was at the foot of his bed. And when he noticed him, the little man ran under the covers and disappeared. We have a home video of me at around three years old. I'm just sitting in the bathtub talking to my mom about whatever three-year-olds have to talk about. The video seems like your average home video of a toddler, talking, until I stopped my current train of thought and abruptly insert that my dad has broken his neck. My mom stops me and asks why I would say that, and of course I didn't have an answer. I just repeated myself and said it again, and then went back to talking about whatever I had been talking about before. The video was filmed in a house in the town I was born in, and soon we moved into my old grandparents' house in another town. My dad had been working the graveyard shift when we moved into the new house, and one night he was later than usual coming home. My mom had stayed up waiting for him, but his dad showed up at our house instead, saying that we had to go to the hospital. My dad had been falling asleep at the wheel and had hit a car head-on while coming home. The crash broke his neck. I remember going to see him at the hospital that night, but I didn't remember having said that this exact thing was going to happen some six or seven months before. My dad lived and is alright now, and my mom showed me the video when I was around 12. My dad said that his brothers had predicted things or said things out of nowhere that ended up happening too. I feel like it's all just an odd coincidence rather than having a family of people who have predicted multiple events, but the date on the tape and the house that we lived in are from before my dad's accident. The tape is there and the date shows it to be true, but I still have a hard time believing I said what I did, when I did. I ride my bicycle at night. 
to me, there is nothing more freeing than the sensation that I have the world to myself and I can explore and adventure as I please. Last night, I was biking through the neighborhood of my childhood and teenage years. I was in a mood for a bit of nostalgic melancholy, I suppose. There's a road where the development ends that I called the Creepy Wood Street when I was a kid. One side has houses, the other is a train track topped hill. The name came from before the area was expanded and it was a dirt track cutting through the woods. So I was on the former Creepy Woods area when I noticed something felt off. I felt a presence and I can only say it felt like rot. It's hard to articulate it precisely. Around the time that I became aware of this presence, I became aware of something else. Silence. The crickets had stopped their chorus and the air seemed to keep moving, but the rustle of the trees and bushes were somehow muted. Strangely, there was a sensation that these were faded out, rather than an immediate cessation. About this time, I began to feel hunted. I guess fight or flight told me in no uncertain terms that flight was the answer, and I began to pedal like a maniac. I had the notion to not look back. I'm not sure why, but I didn't question it. When I got off the road, I felt a little bit better, but I still felt watched. It was then that I heard what a lot of folks would think is a blood-curdling scream, but I recognized it as a vixen's call. We have a ton of foxes in my area. I somehow felt drawn to it, and sure enough, as I turned off toward it, I saw her. A red vixen. This was a little unique, as I have only seen brown ones before. She regarded me a moment, and then ran off toward the creepy wood street. I didn't think a lot of it, until I saw a fox at the next turn who did the same, then again at the next intersection, which was the road leading out of the neighborhood. Granted I knew the way out, but I felt like I was being guided by them somehow, protected. All of them also dashed off after looking at me a moment, all toward the road where I felt like something was after me. I'm so curious to know what anybody else thinks. I'd like to know if anybody has any idea what the thing after me was, and why the foxes seemed to show me a safe path. It was a really cool experience, whatever it was. I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal, so I don't really know what to believe. But the only stories that are even a little similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. To give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences, like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, I've been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in my bed, on my phone with earbuds in, something I do almost every night, when I began to hear whistling coming from out my window. I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistle, trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late. And to be honest, I get more excited that something's happening and that I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. 
I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour I waited for the whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return to its one minute whistle. Until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together, only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped when it retreated back down the other side of the street. As I heard it leave, I almost immediately felt the pit in my stomach subside, and while I was still confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. So the next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that live close by if they had ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was some kind of animal, which made me feel a lot better. But I wanted a definite answer of what I heard. I stayed up for hours that night, researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was. So I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I've never heard the whistling again. Except, lots of weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing somebody, or something, walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways and sometimes even yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. Then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. And then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house. And whatever was holding that flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I swear I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching because I couldn't find anything about animals, but now I've begun researching any stories even similar to mine, hoping that either I'm not alone, or even better, somebody has the answer to the strange occurrences going on. Because I would like to start sleeping at more normal times again, and not have to be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something else, coming to get me in my sleep. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn just talking when dusk started to set in. So I told John that I had to be going or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember it just being a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I looked up and noticed a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he'd been following me, and I hadn't questioned it, to ask if he saw it too, but he was gone. I turned back, and the figure stood in the same spot. For some reason I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it and was able to suddenly make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure close up, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper as traditionally pictured. But it was unlike any iteration I'd ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in the sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. 
The part that I remember disturbing me the most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled that of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice. It was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he told me, you're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I awoke, and the only dream or thought that I've ever been compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Does anyone have any theories as to what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend who was in the dream, and he thinks it's connected to the time when I was about 14. I drowned in the reservoir, but I was pulled back out by my brother, and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go, and a peace overcoming me before I blacked out, then nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I'd been underwater for at least a few minutes before he managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anybody else might think. I had just gotten back from the beach, and I went inside the house, looking for my grandmother. The door was unlocked, and she never leaves without locking the door. I didn't see her on the couch, and her bedroom door was not closed, so I knew she wasn't taking a nap. But it was just odd that she wasn't on the couch or the front porch. I glanced at the table, and there was no note. I called for her and I heard a kind of muffled sound that I thought might have been a muffled call for help. I ran to the back. I didn't see her on the bed, so I ran to the bathroom and she wasn't there either. I called again for her, and I didn't hear anything. So I looked around the bathroom once more, and then back to the bedroom. I swear that I saw her laying on the floor in the bedroom. I saw her long enough and well enough to see what she was wearing a blue sweater, and jeans. I blinked, and she wasn't there. For a moment, I thought I just imagined it, so I ran to the front of the house and looked around. I thought maybe I should go get my mom. This time, though, I saw my grandma's neon yellow notepad on the kitchen table, so bright that it was impossible not to see, and there was a note saying she'd gone across the street for a second. I looked at that table, and there was no note before. I felt so disoriented and confused for a second. I went back outside, and there was my grandmother with the neighbor. She was wearing a completely different outfit, too. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to freak anybody out. I just kind of hope whoever that other person I saw got help passing on, or whatever they needed. Long story short, I signed my grandma up for a clothing subscription. You know, the kind that you fill out a questionnaire and a stylist picks things out for you and sends them to you in the mail. You try them on and keep what you like. It's like a subscription box. Anyway, my grandmother called me and said that she wanted to keep everything, so I logged into her account to mark everything. Guys, I shit you not. The sweater that my grandma was wearing when I had seen her on the floor she received it in that pack. I'm kind of freaking out. I want to tell her, but again, I also don't want to come off like a weirdo. I mean, she already knows I'm weird, I just don't want her to think I'm that kind of weird. I guess I'm safe for a while because it's the summer and that's definitely a winter top, but I don't know. It makes me nervous.
so I'm not really sure how to explain what has happened in my apartment recently, but I will give it a shot. So my girlfriend and I moved into our first floor two bedroom apartment in February. One of the bedrooms seemed to have an odor that irritated my girlfriend and her mom's cat allergies. We just assumed that the previous tenant had a cat, even though they said they didn't. Anyway, the landlord had a professional carpet cleaning company come and clean the room, but the odor remained, just not as prominent. Usually we just kept that door closed. I work from 1 p.m. to 1 a.m., so I'm not home until usually 2 a.m. My girlfriend started telling me that she would hear people in the kitchen during the night. You can't hear any of our neighbors talk, even during the day. I mostly just brushed it off, until one night when I woke up at 4 a.m. for no reason. I heard a deep voice right behind me say, Hey there. And that was just the start. A few weeks later when I got home at 2 a.m., I was in the bathroom getting ready for bed. I was facing the door of the bathroom, looking out into the apartment, but I had my head turned looking at my back in the mirror. I saw what I thought was my girlfriend walk out of the room and go to the kitchen. It spooked me, and I looked out and didn't see anybody in the apartment. I checked our room, and my girlfriend was still in bed. The next morning, my girlfriend woke me up and asked if I had knocked her lunchbox off the refrigerator when I got home. I told her that I hadn't, but it was on the floor when I got home. It wasn't even on the edge when I put my ice pack back in the freezer. She also asked if I had gone into the other bedroom when I got home because the door was slightly ajar, and I told her no. So, we still aren't sure what's been happening in our apartment. It seems to only happen in waves because nothing of note has happened in a week or two. I know what you're going to think, but I really need you to hear me out. I firmly believe in the existence of aliens, but I'm also very skeptical of evidence that's presented. But after what happened to me, I don't know what to believe. So a couple of years ago, I had picked up my sister from her school dance, and we were on the drive home. The road we took to get home had no street lights and about three homes along the side of it. This road was in the middle of wine country. It was about 9 p.m. in the winter, so the sun had gone down a while past and the road was pitch black. The road was hilly, so when you reached at the top of one of the hills, you could see all the way down the road. There were no other cars on the road. As I was driving, some kind of machine or craft went by about 30 feet in front of my car from the left side of the road to the right. The speed is not something I can be 100% sure of, but I know that it was going by fast enough that I couldn't make out its shape. All I could see was that it had what appeared to be headlights on all sides, no brake lights in the back. It had to be about six to eight feet long, but again, it went by so fast that I cannot be positive on that number. At first, I dismissed it as some kid riding around on a dirt bike or an ATV. On the right side of the road was a huge field, so I figured that once I got to where it had gone by, I would have been able to see whatever it was in the field. I reached where the craft had gone, but there was nothing. I drove around a bend where you could see the whole field, and there was nothing to be seen. I was and am so confused about what I saw that night. I mean, maybe it could have been somebody on a bike or a cart, but I've never seen any man-made vehicle that has white headlights on all sides, that moves that fast, and that can disappear in moments. And this happened 14 years ago, and it happened while I was pregnant with my first, when my grandmother, who I was very close to, 
was dying. Anyway, my ex-husband was on the computer until he heard me screaming and yelling in my sleep. He came to wake me up and calm me down, so I did. He went to go to the bathroom and while he was washing his hands, he saw in the mirror, which was facing our bed, a girl standing over me, looking at me. I was screaming in my sleep again. He said it was a shadow, and then he saw her walk away and disappear. He couldn't find her and thought it was bizarre, but he didn't feel that it was evil. A few months later, he saw her doing the same thing, only this time, I was sleeping peacefully. I had my baby and my grandmother had already passed away. We had a nightlight in our bedroom so that I could see my way around when getting up to feed the baby. He said that he could see her face more clearly due to the nightlight, but couldn't see who it was. She didn't look at him. She was just staring directly at me while I slept. And then she turned and walked away and disappeared. That was the last time that he saw it happen. What could that be? It's kind of creepy to hear that some girl is just standing by my bed looking at me while I sleep, even if he doesn't think it's evil. It still boggles my mind to this day. The house we had was brand new and we had built it only a year prior, so we have no idea where a spirit would have come from. Last night, I had a very disturbing dream. I was driving the car with my wife riding shotgun. My kid was in the back seat. When we reached a sharp curve, I saw the headlights of a large vehicle coming down the wrong side. Turns out it was a bus. I tried to swing my car away from the oncoming bus, but I got hit on the side. We went skidding across the road and I could see the face of my terrified wife and my son flying in the back seat. Then I woke up and I had to calm myself down before I could go back to sleep. Just a dream, right? Well, this morning during breakfast, I turned the pages of the local daily over. Then I saw it. There was a story of a family that had gotten killed the night before in an accident when their car was sideswiped by a bus. The freakiest part though, is that the car is the same make of mine the bus is from the same company as the one in my dream, and the location where they got hit was where I was in my dream as well. Am I just trying to fit things into my dream narrative, or is there something to this? I'm really freaked out.